Welcome, Catherine, to Off The Bench podcast. Uh, we are so pumped to have you on this episode. Um, and I firstly know you're probably very busy enjoying uh, retired life um, and, <laughs> and enjoying everything that comes with that. Um, how are you doing anyway? Um, well, I'm actually not really feeling retired at the minute because I'm having to hang on for uh, the 100, which is in August. So I'm in a bit of a funny place at the minute where... I want to just relax and chill out, pretty much do nothing, hide away um, and sort of like just be myself for a year. But um, it's turning into like um, loads of opportunities being thrown at me, like lots of uh, media. Um, I'm going to be working on the ashes with BBC and Sky and um, yeah. And then obviously the hundred. So I'm actually (laughs) probably busier than I was before. (laughs) So it's it's going well, but not in the way that I anticipated. Yeah, anticipated a nice restful period, being able to yeah. maybe go on a nice holiday. Everybody I know in sport, athletes that say that, they're like, yeah, coming to retirement, yeah. planning like a really nice break, not having to be involved in the sport all, and then actually you just get appearance after appearance or then, mm. yeah, like opportunities to go and do things. So And then you're like, I can't turn this down, I'm going to have to do it now. Yeah, I've also got a house build going on at the minute, which is carnage. Um, So I'm trying to manage that as well. Not good. That is a lot of juggling, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, I mean, the news of your retirement from international cricket um, came, was it a few weeks ago now? I mean, how have you kind of settled into that? Because you had a 19-year career like it's a long time to to kind of um yeah decide to step away um when you look back on on it uh, yeah how do you feel now I guess with the the benefit of a few weeks um it's I'm finding it quite strange actually it's a bit of an adjustment um at first like I felt when I made the decision I felt really relieved and and positive about my decision I'm not saying I feel the opposite to that now I, I I definitely made the right decision but it was more it's more that I'm adjusting my life now to life without cricket um which isn't really happening because I've obviously took on a lot of cricket work <laughs> but um yeah it's just finding my way around day to day not being around lots of people not being told what to do where to go what to wear um and you know like I don't like being bored so having stuff to do like I couldn't just retire and do nothing like I've I've always got to be doing something um finding things to entertain me so it's it's been really difficult and and I think the major part is not having that around um um, we've lived in each other's pockets for the last 12 years um touring and um and when we're not touring being at home and or just hanging out so being with someone every minute of the day and then suddenly not seeing them is 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 pretty strange to me which obviously I've got to adjust to now but um yeah it's not the best thing but I'm working it out and um I'm sure I'll find a good balance at some point (laughs) yeah it, it surely will take time like it's like I say like nearly two decades of 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 work and 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 kind of routine and all that kind of thing when when you look back to 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 the girl that started playing cricket growing up in Barnsley do you do, 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 do you think I mean do you think she ever would have thought of you playing for England and doing everything you have in the sport oh uh, no absolutely not um I yeah my upbringing and my early years uh, especially early teen years like were drastically different like um extremely shy I was bullied a lot, um, not really knowing who I was and what I what I liked or what would make me happy. Um, the only thing I knew was that I was um, a bit of a tomboy and I really liked sports. Um, and I found that I was quite good at most sports, uh, mainly because I'm one of six and the one up from me, I'm the youngest. My brother, Daniel, he he was really good at all sports. And naturally, I just want to be better than him at everything. So, um, yeah, that's where that came from. And, um, yeah, finding my way through that. And then 
accidentally coming on to cricket at an elite level. I always just played it because it was something that I was good at. Um, so I, I did that because I was good at it and I enjoyed it. So that made me feel special because there weren't many things, unfortunately, that, that made me feel that way. So I, I kind of, even though it was really, it gave me a lot of anxiety because being around boys and um, putting yourself on show is terrifying as an introvert but equally I was good at it and I enjoyed it so I was like really torn as to whether to keep doing it or not and so there was always something that kept me there and so like clinging on to that and finding my way through that then that opportunity arose to play for England and it was just a complete accident um and I didn't want to do it because I thought I can handle this at this level but any more than this it would be a bit much. So, no, I would have never done it had people not pretty much guide, like pushed me. My sister pushed me there. My brother pushed me there. My parents, um, yeah. It, it, no, I could never have ever have seen this coming, and it wasn't something I wanted or wanted to push myself towards. So, mm. Mm. I, th- I think people who've watched you play cricket would be maybe surprised about imagining you as kind of an introverted kind of teenager <laughs> because you're such a huge personality on the on the pitch um yeah, yeah where does that come from then um I think she was always there she just got beaten down so much like um I was quite big I'm not sure if you can say fat that's the only word I've got in the head um as a teenager and so like and I was bullied for that a lot and that sort of stamps down your confidence doesn't it and um push, makes you very internal um and so when I arrived there it, I was this person who was just hidden away and um like that by underneath I was you know I'm quite a bubbly mental joker and so <laughs> <laughs> there was always somebody passionate underneath ready to come out and I guess cricket and the highs that come with that and the people that you meet brought that out of me. And it took a few years to be fair from debut. Um, Cause for my debut, the team was made up of um, older established people. So they were obviously quite intimidating. So when I became the older player, that's when I came out of my shell and started annoying everyone. So. Yeah. I mean, you, you've seen the game go from, from completely amateur to, to what it is now. I mean, when you look back on your debut, the first World Cup you played in, I mean, 2004, 2005, what, it, it must feel a world away um, in terms of the support you guys get now and 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 also just the attention on it as well. What, what are your kind of memories of those first few years of playing for England? Um, so obviously at the, at the very beginning, we were... We weren't paid by the ECB. We were um, had Sport England lottery funding, uh, and that's I don't even know if that's still around anymore. But that was how we financed ourselves to be able to drive to Loughborough to to train um, or to be able to get to county championships and take part in those tournaments. But it was it was such a minuscule amount, and there were things you still had to pay for, like. I still had to pay for half of my own equipment and and stuff like that. Um, so an away trip was all, felt like an absolute luxury, and that only happened really once a year. Um, whereas now, you know, you could go abroad up to six times, depending on things that you take part in. So um, it is a completely different world. Um, it's also a different mentality because the way I felt back then and the way I feel now is is so different and the memories I've generated through it being different um because some of my best memories are from when I had not we had nothing I had nothing and it wasn't um broadcast or cared about um because it does it, when the cameras are there they add they add so much like they you get all the negative comments on on social media you get um all the expectation anxiety that comes with performing on tv or in front of thousands of people and 
we didn't have any of that then you were just playing for the love of it and you know the pride and the fun and being with your mates so it's it's both a blessing and a curse <laughs> now mm, mm. that's really and, um I read it somewhere that, that you in um in was it in two thousand and five in Delhi that you had monkeys that were in <laughs> that were in your hotel rooms. Is that right? So not physically in there because that would have been really dodge. But um, <laughs> yeah, they were like rattling on the windows. The windows were all, like barred up, um, and we wondered why. Felt like we were in a bit of a dodgy hotel, and then that happened, and I was like, oh, that be that would be why then because um, obviously they would have got in otherwise um, but yeah that was an interesting tour I think that was my first trip to India and it was a bit of an eye-opener but it was a great experience at the time I was moaning constantly like we were all ill um, we were getting bitten things just kept getting going wrong like throwing your kit on top of a bus and hoping it stays on there while you travel um, like <laughs> being like hot like surrounded by people wanting to touch you you know because you're different to them and like it was just mad absolutely mad and not being able to eat anything because everything made you ill <laughs> oh but it's it was wild. like i think it's as well like looking stories. back and I, I think like looking back as well do you think yourself like what I guess like stories of what I hear as well from from sort of in, within Rome within my own sport about what in the early days people would put up with and what we would do and you think that's the world of an elite sport and high performance sport and none of it shouts or screams high performance right. you know you're talking about they're putting your kit on top of of a truck or something and hoping that it stays there by the time <laughs> that you get there especially when you're paying for it as well in in yeah. those early stages do you right. think it's wild now do you think maybe some of the younger girls that now are are in the team would be horrified by some of those stories oh yeah no, they wouldn't do it they just wouldn't come on tour <laughs> everyone's a privileged queen now um <laughs> yeah we we are we're just like we what we expect now is different like this the standard is so high that anything below that is um you know unacceptable which is mental like I just come from a place of hard graft and I like that, like my dad uh, ran to work and back every day. So he totaled like 100 kilometers running every day. He worked down a mine from seven till seven, so he never saw the daylight. Like he used to go around turning lights off after me because, you know, he's got six kids to support. Like I'm just from a place where you you put like a breath wrong, you get a smack for it. Like, and that's just me, like strict upbringing a hard grafter, uh, work for everything you got. I never given anything. Um, and I like that. I used to be, I used to be mad about that, but I, I absolutely love that that happened to me because it made me who I am and I am self-sufficient. I can handle the horrors of the world. And I just wonder if these days we are, you know, not saying you should smack your children, <laughs> but we are, we're, we're not, we don't have that, I call it a bit of bastard um, that we need to be able to survive in this world by yourself and um, realise that, you know, you, if you can go through this, you can go through that. So it is, it's tough. It's a scary thought. Um, mm. Do you think that level yeah. of like, I guess your upbringing and I guess the struggle of um, growing up, but you know, in in an environment like that way, and you know, I know from watching my mum work really hard and not make a lot of money at all, and we never had a lot, so I I sort of adopted this mentality and this level of resilience about me that I think has helped me in my career and has helped me be able to work firstly work hard and understand that hard work was what made me successful but also this level of resilience and going if things aren't going your way um you kind of just have to stick at it and that's just sometimes mm -hmm. there is no other choice but trying to to keep going at it do you think that's what's led to having such a successful and long career that level of resilience that you have yeah, absolutely. Like resilience is the number one ingredient for me. And my, um, you know, that breeds a power of will, doesn't it? And like the willpower that I've had throughout my whole career is why I've lasted 20 years. I don't know 
how many cricketers have had that long a career, especially as a fast bowler, is generally a short life span. Um, is yeah, is how I is the key ingredient for me, and I've had that uh, bred into me throughout my whole upbringing. Um, major injuries do that for you. Being a lesbian does that for you. Um, you know, there's uh, just on that, like that, uh, every day there's something, you know, to ignore or to, um, I don't know, push through, if you like. There's always, the, there's, I've, I seem to have chosen a pretty hard lifestyle. <laughs> um, but I'm grateful for it because, like I said, I could probably function and get by life better than most people I know have got it easy, if you like. Um, but yeah, it's true. Like, um, these are lessons I wish I could teach, but you, are you serious? You have to go through them to get through the other side and realize what you're made of, I guess. Mm. And what, what do you think? I mean, you've been in, in teams with in the last few years, I guess. I mean, Alice Campsey, I think, was born like a few weeks or a few days mm. before you made your debut, which is remarkable <laughs> that, that you were playing with her. But what do you think you did add to kind of, um, the environment where you could kind of, yeah, the, 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 the wealth of experience that you had, how did you kind of hand that down, I guess, to, to the new players coming into the England environment? Laura Winfield is one of my best mates. Um, she's only 31, but she's, uh, she was a flag bearer for my debut, a little kid waving a flag and me running through it. Um, and she grew up watching me play and she's from the same county as myself. And, and I'd say she's one of the, most resilient people I know as well and um, these girls who have come into the team now where and been a part of it with me have um, have watched me play as they've been growing up so hopefully you know that helped them somehow um, because that you always have to refer to something don't you to to check yourself against it like um, I don't know, like the inspiring women I would have watched as I was growing up and taken lessons from. Had they not done something, I wouldn't have realised, well, maybe I can too, for instance. And I guess from talking to Alice, that's something that she's taken from me too and watching me and how I operate and perform around training. And I always try to give the best version of myself every time I every time not only when I play but when I train because they need to see how hard you need to train to be able to build that resilience um to then lay it all out there in front of everyone so yeah I would like to think I'd pass something on to them and that they would do the same yeah I bet I bet I mean I, I can't imagine kind of coming into a team environment with the person that you've looked up to all of your life it must be <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty pretty insane for them and um I know you, you you've you've got kind of your gregarious side I'm sure you've got um that you you bring a lot of fun to the team environment too but that must also be kind of intimidating for them to kind of go in and be like oh my god <laughs> this is Catherine like run like what yeah they, we've had like these sessions before where we've come together and we've spoke about stuff like that like I've gone so we've talked about uh, like giving feedback and stuff like that. And, and one of them was like, that was quite intimidating. And I'm like, what? And I'm definitely intimidating on a pitch. I'll give them that, but not off. And I guess that's where um, it's always worked out because I have a different version of me on and off the pitch. Um, and so with that feedback, I would just be like, please don't be intimidated by me like off the pitch if you ever want to speak to me ask me a question learn anything or even just you know use me um feel free like don't be afraid like this is what I'm here for um and so once I, th I guess that ice was broken then it's you know the, all the natural learnings and in integration happens because obviously naturally a near 40 year old is not going to hang out with a 17 year old 
normally. <laughs> so, yeah, these things have to happen, you know, in meetings and on the training ground. And and it did. And I'm glad for it. And And in the end, I did start. I wanted them to come to me, but I decided in the end I was just going to make the move because time is precious. <laughs> Um, yeah. But yeah, it worked. It worked out well, and I'd like to think I'd passed a few things on. And you've been such an incredible role model, not only in that teammate sense, Catherine, but you've also been an incredible role model for the LGBT community um, in your presence um, uh, as as a lesbian. And I think you know speaks so powerfully to a very small community of us that exists within sport. But um, I guess for, for you, um, before you were a role model, and I guess what did them early days of, I guess, you know, you've spoken before about struggling to tell your parents that you were gay and, and how do you look back on that, that, that sort of um, moment of coming out and, and coming out to your parents? And I guess, how did you look at that? I guess now where you are today and, and now being having, having a wife and being able to live out publicly, how does that mm. kind of compare to the early days of, of Catherine before she ever came out? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, I, I, I don't, it's still not something I feel comfortable talking about. Um, I, I definitely have to make myself vulnerable. I think it comes across that I do it quite easily, for sure. But it's it's not. I'm always having to sort of hold stuff in because it is like a, it, the being gay links to my mum so heavily and she's the one person that can just trigger me off in a second. Um, shit and it's happening now (laughs) um yeah so like in the beginning like my mom's a devout christian and so being gay in any form is like just the you know be all and end all with her and so when i came out at 21 um to her officially i actually wrote her a letter because i couldn't do it to her face that was it was just too hard um, and that was like the day everything changed. Um, my relationship with my mom just sort of like faded out to nothing. I left home, tried to like, um, you know, find my way without that negativity and all that there, um, which helped. It was difficult, but it helped. Um, and I did that through my coach at the time, my cricket coach, our head coach, like told me it would be okay as a parent he would want me to if I was his daughter to make that move to let them know and it would be okay and it kind of had the opposite effect so that bothered me for quite a while and it always will because my mum will never she's so stuck in her way of thinking that that will never change like she's nearly 80 now and I don't expect her to change she still loves me she doesn't accept that side of me that I've decided that's okay um yeah it is hard and it always will be like uh, and I'll always carry a lot of shame because of the way she feels about it with me um so like hiding I won't hold Nat's hand in public for instance because I feel like you know I'm being stared or judged and that just all comes from you know the fact that we're made to believe it's wrong and, and gross and I'm finding strange words to use here, but um, that's just it. And hopefully, you know, it's gone better for sure. Like I'm able to like actually speak to, about it, tell the world that I love someone um, and that I'm married to them. Uh, and and that's that doesn't have all this. So it's really great to have her positivity linked to it. So her parents have, fantastic and totally accepting um yeah like the the hardest one of the hardest slash best days of my life was being married um my parents weren't there and uh, my brother walked me down the aisle and that's were there and they loved it and they felt all the love from that day um yeah that was a shame but didn't take away how great it was thank god um yeah so that's I guess my sort of upbringing into the world as a lesbian as we all know everybody we've all got a story Mm. 
them that's really enough. powerful to, to hear you talk about like that I mean it makes me feel emotional just I know the fear <laughs> of um I guess that fear of rejection is that fear of uh, for for most young queer people um that that element of going I'm going to lose the people I I love around me because of the way society has taught them to hate me and who I am. And um, quite ironic, we're talking about this in the month of pride, but I think for me, uh, it just relates so much to that, of that fear of being like, but I have to be who I am. And I have either found my person or I know I am this person and I have to be that because I think it, it does fundamentally, it starts to affect you. And I don't know how you felt, um, I guess in, in your, your sort of teenage years, but it started to affect my mental health. It started to affect my performance in sport. And I just couldn't continue to, to live like that. And after I came out, I mean, it's made the biggest difference in my life, but it's also meant that I can find my person, you know, I'm, I'm engaged now um, uh, to my fiance June and it's just been the most beautiful thing. And I, I think that, you know, I never had those sort of role models growing up, those LGBT role models in sport. I just didn't see that. And I think it's so powerful in the presence of if you even saying like, I don't care if I get kind of rejected and even from my own family, but I'm going to be out and live my life and, mm. and just be happy and find your person mm. and, the, the impacts in just your presence, you you and that together, you spoke about a, a little bit earlier and we'll go on to that in, in, next, but just the presence that you have in the sport, it's just powerful. And I think sometimes we don't realise that as athletes because we're just living our lives mm. and as people, but the impact is is greater than you can ever think of just your presence of being there. So firstly, thank you from, from a younger queer person on that, but... <laughs> You speak about Nat so beautifully in your wedding day um, and it's making me very excited for planning my wedding. Um, but you, you speak about that and I guess is there's, there's got to be an element of difficulty there with you both being teammates. I can't imagine. I mean, my fiance Judy just plays basketball and we're both athletes and that comes with its extreme challenges mm. of us both being away and our programs clashing. But is there another element of that difficulty or is it easier even with you both being on the same team as well? Um, no, what's hard now is her being away. Um, I, 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 we both have loved being together every second of the day. And I think that's how I knew she, I was supposed to be with her for the rest of my life is because I can't be around her and ever be angry or upset or annoyed. Like she just makes me whole, you know? Shit, <laughs> I'm getting emotional again. <laughs> This podcast scared yeah, me emotional just, tonight. I know. I know. Yeah. I'm like holding it back. <laughs> yeah, she's just like everybody needs to find their Natalie. Like you found yours, and just make everything easier. Like my whole life's been quite difficult, and I guess sad and at, like cricket is how I find my happiness. Shit. Mm. Um. <laughs> And Take she, a moment if you need like, to. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. And she just sort of makes all that go away. So now I don't have cricket. The one thing that made me happy, I have her, which is, you know, brilliant. And everybody needs to find that and allow themselves to have it, um, mm. which I didn't for a long time. So, yeah, it's brilliant. These are happy tears, <laughs> if you can. Uh, I mean... <laughs> It's it's so yeah beautiful to hear you talk about Nat and your relationship and finding each other through cricket. And I mean, I, I read about uh, if I I think this is right, but the, the story about how you asked Nat out um, must be one of the best <laughs> best of those stories I've ever heard. Where you asked no, her, it's well, awful. You, you can tell the it's story. Cringe. Come on, you can tell the story. It's not cringe. Oh, I think it's incredible. It's cringe. <laughs> it's more of a joke at the time, like if you can imagine athletes on tour we get bored and we do daft things and that was like one of the um years i mean i'm not a love island fan <laughs> i find it utterly ridiculous um but <laughs> the girls were watching it and it was it was like a you know a conversation starter so the ones of us that were like no way am i watching that crap we ended up watching it um <laughs> and then you get sucked in don't you and um, there's something one of them did on there. Are they all like spelled out? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> on the floor. Oh, on the balcony, the no? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> so I said the day before to one of my mates, um, and my best mate actually, uh, if we win the World Cup tomorrow, um, Amaras Nat now officially. Um just like as a passing comment and then but I definitely meant it that deep down just being a, a you know um a wet bag about it I, I just kept holding back not doing it and then hey presto we win the bloody world cup um and then it was such a, a massive occasion like it, it it blew everyone away like got everyone and then my best mate came up to me and she's like, do you remember what you said? I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so she, like, assembled everyone. And at Lord's, there's the it's the pavilion's obviously really famous and the balconies are really famous. And I took that out into the balcony and there they were all on the floor, all, like, spread out in this I love you word. And I was just like, this is horrific. <laughs> <laughs> but she found it great. So um, We have got a picture somewhere, actually. I mean, Obviously, yeah. Technology. <laughs> so, the Lord's classic Pavilion. Classic fashion, it's extravagant and over the top. And <laughs> yeah. I love about this community. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's truly awful, but funny as hell at the time. She loved it, and I'm sure she'll never forget that. So, yeah. yeah. Collectively, the best day ever, I guess, winning the World Cup at Lord's on that incredible day. And then... Yeah, and um, well done me. Like, because how can I forget that day? <laughs> like, I'm not going to forget about getting a card or anything, am I? 23rd of July, what a day. <laughs> love that, love that. Faced, um, I guess challenges of, uh, of of being gay and, and in your experience of that, not only from your own personal stuff, but is there any challenges that you and Nat have faced along the way within sport just from, from being gay as well? Uh, No, so we're really lucky in the fact that our teammates have always been brilliant um our coaches have been brilliant um obviously relationships in a team from a business perspective aren't great like if Mm -hmm. you fall out um then your performance can lack or somebody ends up getting pushed out if one's better than the other at what they do so luckily um we're both always been very mature never ever fallen out um and we only ever inspire each other to be better because we both effectively do the same job we're both all-rounders and always wanted to be better than each other (laughs) (laughs) so naturally it brings the best out of us so um from a business perspective it actually was good for them but luckily the, the surroundings for us were great all our teammates are just really accepting um we have a lovely like family supportive environment which is what you can just always hope for which is not always the case obviously and um the coaches and the ucb and the company itself have always been great around that too so we're very lucky in that in that regard um but it could have obviously been a, a lot different when you say you guys kind of wanted to always kind of strive to be better than each other, were you the types that would compare stats after games or after training sessions or <laughs> that ever thing? Uh, no, not stats or anything. We just know. You know when you're better than someone. <laughs> <laughs> There's this um, time we had a game and they always do this to us, right? It's really annoying, actually. The coach would always put me on the opposite team to her. So obviously that's like when it gets real fiery. Um, I don't know why, but it always brought out the most competitive side in me when I was playing against her. So we call them like internal games. We're practicing, but we've got to form two teams. So, Mm. um, And there's two days worth of games. And on the first day, uh, my team won. And I, I I batted really well, actually. And I was so determined to win. I like guided out. I got this like a score that I would never get uh, guided our team to the win and walked off and I was really smug and um got a trophy for it like we had these trophies we made that just to make it you know a bit more fun yeah and then the next day she didn't say anything this is not like so I'm like red mist warrior 
um she's a cool calm patient assassin next day <laughs> no words just all action <laughs> unbelievable performance player of the match won them the game on her own and I was just like Ugh, for God's sake <laughs> <laughs> that was what luckily there were only two games because that if there was a third it could have been hectic but yeah it was it was fun that was just like an example of tit for tat and bringing out the best in each other so it was fun <laughs> coaching dream I'd say <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably yeah, I get like that. And then play basketball against against Jude and I, I have no clue how to play basketball, but I instantly want to be better than her. I'm just like, right, I don't care. Like, I just got to be better than you at this because it's just level of competitiveness. <laughs> Even if we go yeah. to the gym, it's like I've got to shoulder press more than you. And I mean, her thing is bench press. You can bench press on a real amount. And I'm just like trying to get into the bar, trying to do a one one rep max just so I can have one up on her. Um, <laughs> We used to do CrossFit together a little bit and um, oh. yeah, we used to, we sometimes had to be on a team with each other because if we went against each other, we'd both just end ourselves and we'd have training the next day and for a week we wouldn't be able to even like, I wouldn't Whoa. even be able to push in my wheelchair. That's how like <laughs> competitive it used to get and so we just had to start working together and stop going against each other because <laughs> otherwise it would just get way too much. So yeah. I can definitely resonate with the feeling of, uh, of being quite competitive and some of us are a bit more more silent and silent assassins as like Nat sounds um so that's 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 really funny um yeah. but you know you've spoken a little bit about um, struggles with your mental health struggles in with with coming back from from injuries and stuff like that and how you've battled with that and um do you think that that it was those sort of injuries and the, and the mental health that has, has sort of encouraged you to finish your career now and 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 to sort of come away from it or would you say that you've learned to be able to deal with that over time and learned to be able to manage your mental health a bit more and the injuries that come with playing cricket um yeah I've had like waves with mental health I guess over my 20-year career like it's not really something that I knew or identified at the time because there's so much information on it now and like um and and so much care and support like in the team in the last two years it's like are you okay uh we have a full-time psychologist um i can turn on my phone on instagram twitter and and i can i could scroll once a day and see something related to it so it is there if you need it and even if you don't want to call someone or or deal with something you can read about it so you can do it behind closed doors too whereas before I didn't know what you know you didn't read about these things you didn't see it there was no psychological support my parents don't talk um they don't we don't have conversations about anything like I can't go to my parents and be like I'm feeling like this today but that's just not a thing so there was nothing so it was all about self-learning and recognition on on things like that so I've had very much a a journey (laughs) and ups and downs in how I feel and I've I've got that from failing and losing games or being really angry and trying to figure out why am I really angry um (laughs) um I don't know talk sorry so the people in my life I've chosen to surround myself with a very positive a very outgoing very loving people and I have always done that I don't have many many friends but the friends that I do have are very special to me and surrounding myself with those kind of people is really important and I think I might have unconsciously done that because of my upbringing um either not trusting people or not wanting to be around negativity or people with not the same values as me. So that's been like my one really key ingredient is my brilliant siblings, um, really close, proper friends um, who would do anything for me. Um, And then I guess, you know, going through all those challenges and battles that I've faced, especially the injuries, like my first back surgery, 
really not me. Like, it's, yeah, as you know, being debilitated is a really shite thing. Like, you don't realise how lucky you are to be able to do the things that you can do as a human. And when, when I had, before I had my first back injury, like, going from being an extremely active, everyday kind of athlete to not being able to do anything was it was really tough and and it put me in a pretty dark place like I thought I was gonna you know never play again having had a taste of it for the first couple of years and yeah it you know I mean I'm saying I've you know as full well like how that feels and I, I yeah I wanted to try and get through that but I had to get through that on my own and you know it did make me a better person and that's when I started to create my life outside of cricket because I was so scared that if it got taken away from me suddenly like it did again which it did I would I needed something in place that I could fall back on um, and for any athlete or, or anyone really I would encourage that so much because that gave me a bit of peace of mind and some security to fall back on so mm. yeah and I have that now now I've retired that's why the decision was easy for me is that your when you're are you referring to your property development business there? yeah like, yeah yeah yeah. I, yeah I started that a good 12 years ago mm. yeah I mean it sounds like a lot of work I mean anyone who works in property development would say <laughs> that it's it's all encompassing and you were doing it at the same yeah. time as being an England cricketer and I mean, <laughs> traveling around the world. So that seems pretty, pretty It's extremely insane. stressful. You, I mean, you <laughs> buy or sell one house. It's the most stressful thing you ever do, isn't it? And like, like you said, I was doing that whilst playing in a world event or whatever. I, <laughs> it definitely encroached on my performance. Like, I'd say the last five years of my career were extremely difficult. And I don't think... I played the best level that I could have because I wasn't fully committed to either. But I knew I had to be committed to both somehow. But I wish I could have been 100% a cricketer. So had I been pay paid like a male athlete, I would have been able to just give absolutely everything to cricket. But instead I had to give, you know, half of me to each mm. to be able to have a future. So... And I don't regret that. It's sad, but I don't regret it. It was a necessity. Mm, and I'm, it's a reality, you know, I guess, for, yeah. for for many. I mean, for, for the majority of female athletes, I mean, that's just the way it's got to be. You've got to kind of juggle doing things on the side to keep you going, Some, sometimes to keep you going during your career, but also just to, like you say, think about what comes next. And yeah. for you, I mean, you, you've, you've already touched upon kind of how – what an adjustment, I guess, it's been for you to retire from international cricket. You've still got the 100 this summer. But um, what, why did now feel like the right time? I mean, we're heading into a, a big summer, the Ashes. And um, how do you think it's going to be for you to to be watching it from the other side, I guess? Um, I'm a terrible watcher. Like, I can't watch <laughs> Nat back because I just, I just wanted to do well all the time. And I'm very criti critical of like her performance like you know really annoying parents that just tell you what you should have done and you're like shut up like you would not have done any better in fact you would have done worse <laughs> so like I'm trying not to be like that because it's so easy to criticize from your chair like and I've known that my whole life but yeah I, it all comes from a place of wanting her to be great um so yeah I've now got to do it live and not rip everyone to shreds <laughs> and also not swear, which I find really hard. <laughs> um, I mean, I think people like pun. I think people like pundits who, who really are honest, I guess you could, you, you can rip That's anyone to me. shreds if you want to. <laughs> oh, I just got to do it in a kind way, I guess. Yeah. I think as well in like the women's game as well, I hear a lot about, you know, it's always constantly talking about positive, like record breaking figures and like being like, oh, new record breaking figures, uh, such and such game. And 
but then we fail to forget to actually talk about what's going on in the game. So I think it's so refreshing to have somebody that comes on as a pundit and actually talks about what's going on in the game, not talking about, mm. oh, how amazing is uh, like the women's game for it to be this many people in the stadium. No, I want to talk you to absolutely slate the people on the actual <laughs> pitch that are doing their job because as a, you know, as a sports fan watching that, I want to know what's going on, especially, you know, if you, you don't really know the game in and out, but you want honest mm. reflection. And I think yeah. it'd be great to see I think just this um, commentary on women's sport become that little bit the same as what it is for men's sport. You wouldn't go into a men's mm. game and go, how amazing it is to see all these people here in this stadium supporting the women's game, how incredible it is for them all to be role models. You no, know, you'd be talking about how bad they are at their job. So I, I can't wait for you to sit there and to be uh, honest feedback on what's it going is, on. It is, because with the women's game, they, I don't want to, this is not a, like a blanket comment because it's just, it's a rare occasion but some male pundits do say stuff like that because they don't have enough knowledge about the women's game and so they find things to talk about that's actually quite patronizing like stop referring to it as like as something that's getting there it's growing and all this like we are here we are on a major stage we are on sky sports we do have millions of followers like let's commentate on how good what you're seeing is like and and how you're seeing it how they do that not like all the naff stuff like what you said um (laughs) and i i totally agree but i only can control some of that (laughs) (laughs) and sometimes you get led as what to say so but Mm. i've always tried to tell them like i am just going to be myself um and say the things that come naturally to me because i feel like that's the best way and if you don't like it, don't employ me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're going to do just fine. It's going to be fun. <laughs> we'll, we'll all be tuning in. <laughs> um, yeah, I can say all my honest things in my book instead. Is that coming up? Um, I, I've been threatening it. I've been talking about it. And mainly I was just joking about it, but I'm actually dead serious now. I think, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be, it would be, I mainly want to do it right because I want to create a book of memories. Um, like obviously my journey as a whole, all the ugly bits. Um, and and then when I have a kids, I want to be able to tell them my story because for some reason, I don't know if it's age, but I forget stuff all the time. And it's really <laughs> annoying because when you, when I catch up with some old mates from, I don't know, the, 2006 squad they tell me stuff and it brings back so many happy memories and I just wish I could remember them um Mm. so yeah mainly for that reason I I couldn't care if I only gave away one copy (laughs) um it would be you know just great for that reason I think you'll do more than that come on <laughs> I think a lot of people <laughs> will want to hear about 19 years at the top of the uh, at the top of international cricket it's pretty remarkable um I mean I, I feel like we could talk for hours but just to kind of wrap up I wanted to finish with a question we we ask all our guests I mean this this uh, podcast is 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 about kind of uh, championing different women in um in sport athletes broadcasters leaders coaches and I just wonder if you <clears throat> could name anyone outside of your sport who um who you admire who you admired while you were coming up in the sport or who you admire now um that kind of stands out to you as some as yeah a woman working in sport who um has made a difference I guess to you um well personally I when I'm asked this like I don't there's not one person who's inspired me like I take my inspiration from everywhere um and everything um like my mom to a certain degree because of like there's obviously a reason she is the way she is and I know that uh, I know that story um so that inspires me um uh all the people I've ever competed against or um you know been on the same side as they inspire me from the tv that I saw that I was able to see because we only had a black and white telly (laughs) um that inspired me so Monica Sellers 
um, Kelly Holmes, like these people who are just seem so normal to me, not superstars, but that I could be one of them and coming from an army background to suddenly winning something, but winning something so like naturally and shock, like shocked herself doing it as if she'd come done something that she didn't believe she could do. That inspired me. Uh, obviously, Sellers being stabbed and coming back from something horrific, mentally and physically scar you. Like these things stay with you. You don't see them at the time as this big inspirational moment, but they they're there. So I take mine from everywhere um, to try and create the best version of myself. Like there was my best friend who, um, when I came into the cricket team, she retired two years after, but I wanted to be better than her. Like, do you know what I mean? It's yeah. A, a, an array of everyone and everything, I guess. So, yeah. I think I can speak on behalf of both of Molly and I when I say we've been super inspired by you. So thank you so much for coming on today and thank you for sharing your story in such an open and honest way. I think it will speak to so many people listening to this and I'm sure they'll be able to relate to parts of it and we can't wait to read the book more importantly. So yeah, you'll have to keep it up to date when it's coming out and we'll let everybody know. So Yeah, thank get you so it on much. your Christmas <laughs> list. Yeah, definitely. Right, that's it. There's been a date now, Christmas list. By Christmas this year, it will be out there, be, be in your stockings. Thank you so much, Catherine. No worries. Thanks for having me.